of course, a great privilege and uh, pleasure um, more than anything. Uh, my congratulations to the organizers and um, e anyone and everyone who made possible this event um, in this location at this time after so many years of um, staying in the, line, in, the, in the sidelines to having an event around uh, the, the push tie case is, uh, I think, a great, a great success, no matter what I say next. Um, I have a working hypothesis for the historians of science in the room or online that I will try to illustrate with very few, because we don't have time, examples. And the, the working hypothesis is that what happened at the turn of the millennium, at the turn of that century, from the um, 20th to the 21st century, was a unique historical uh, discontinuity. Um, unlike what Brian was referring to, which is we're just in the swamp, falling over and over and over as if the swamp was a, con a constant. The idea of historicizing uh, what happened at that moment uh, makes it possible for me to put um, these events in the context of a historical development that I believe has led and has really impregnated history to explain where it is that we are today. At a time when biology especially has become central, not only to science, but especially to culture, politics, policy, and even economics. So um, I will try to present the idea that um, ARPAD, and of course, it's a, it's a huge privilege to be able to be speaking, uh, you know, under the gaze of this great man. Um, for all the details of his case and importance of his case, um, I would like to propose that ARPAD is much, very important because we got to see his case in such detail. So I'm also very thankful for yesterday when we had um, a great opportunity to build up information and detail about this case, uh, particularly, for example, the chronology of Andy Rowell, who um, seems to coincide with me in saying that the year 1999-2000 is particularly interesting if we are to understand the history of this thing that we call biotech. Um, I believe that during that time, during that end of a uh, century, um, there was this suspension of science. Not necessarily corruption of science, I believe is, it is like the swamp that is always, always trying to swallow you down. Uh, conflict of interest is always there to take care of and so on. But this idea that we could suspend science for this specific moment in the interest of a, an agenda, in the interest of enforcing against contravening evidence, not only a policy position, not only a business proposition, but an ideological stance and a whole epistemological transformation of our understanding of our relationship with the living, which of course includes our relationship to ourselves. So I think uh, putting things in that context would help a lot in understanding what's happening to us today, not just putting it in the past. Um, it's difficult for me because I, uh, this is not my um, certified profession. I'm not a professional um, in doing this type of analysis. And it's also more difficult. I'm just a, you know, maybe a co ecologist. My training is in mycology. What does it have to do with this kind of analysis? But I do want, I'm an aspiring biologist and an aspiring scientist. Um, it's also difficult because I stand here in front of you much more as an anthropological object, an ethnographic object for you to look at, because I am, in a way, one of the very few cases that can talk to you from the innards of what was happening in that moment. Most of the other cases are not with us, or at least they're not visible. They, do, they have lost their voices. So it is difficult for me because I am also a player there. I focus at my first example in this one paper that we managed to publish by the year 2001, even though the work goes back to um, 1998, 99, 
And several years, about 10 years before that of collaboration with a group of indigenous communities, a coalition of indigenous communities in southern Mexico, the work was done in their lab with their staff uh, that we supported doing it. But the paper and the story is credited to these two names, David Quist and myself, um, maybe because we managed to publish it in Nature. We were authorized to put our names on this story, even though we are simply participants in a much more collaborative kind of um, enterprise um, many years in the making. Uh, the evidence that we brought forward is very humble. I do not claim, some people say this is a very important paper, and it was from many points of view, but it is a very humble piece of um, evidence. Um, the standard at the day, in that day, the um, 1990s, was simply PCR and gel electrophoresis, where, as you know, where you're looking at bands, and it is the optical recognition of band, bands on that gel. Uh, mark there for those of you who might not see it clearly, because it is actually quite faint. When you look, can I point with this? Yeah. When you look at the existing bands on these, on these uh, lanes here, without the line, they are really faint. But they can be amplified through nested amplification to make it very clear that you do have a sequence, a telltale sequence uh, present evidencing the presence of genetic engineering within native land races of um, maize, of corn, in the cradle of origin and diversification of this most important crop. Very simple, very little visual, nothing more than visual. There's no numerical analysis here, nothing else, okay? And uh, the, the paper made it through several and increasingly complex layers of peer review. Like I said, it took years of peer review because the first reviews were really enthusiastic and com convinced about the paper. Eventually, it got to the place where Phil Campbell, editor of Nature at that time, was saying, you know, I don't think we're going to publish this, even though they had said already that they would. They kept sending it back to reviewers, trying to find someone who would find a problem with, with the paper. They, they couldn't. And uh, nobody ever um, raised questions that were technical. There were many questions raised, though, that seemed to be coming from a very heterologous place. Not the technical aspects of it, but something seemed to be going on. Strangely enough, and also very interestingly, the story was covered um, in nature. In the pages of nature, you were having a possibility of denying the existence of these bands on a, pho on a photograph, and the news coverage by Rex Dalton. Uh, we are now in 2003, and at this point, on the basis of this and some other activities that I was taking part of, which was trying to prevent my university from signing a really compromising contract with Novartis, for whom I had worked in Switzerland in the past. Uh, because of that, um, there was a question about denying tenure, my tenure at Berkeley, even though, even though someone with access to the internal secret committee that was reviewing the whole case was saying, we have absolutely positive green lighting of this case, and somewhere, somewhat, some, somewhere someone um, seems to be hijacking this case. That's what made the case, in my, in my mind, particularly interesting, because we got an opportunity to look at it. Not because of anything that has to do with me personally, but because it became visible. Um, if you search, we don't have time to go very deeply into this, but an, a controversy ensued. This is simply the coverage within the pages of Nature, going back to 2003, for a couple of years, the whole story evolves over about seven to eight years, um, in which it goes back and forth until eventually, um, and that, this last piece, um, the, the case was uh, uh, turned in my favor, um, so they couldn't really stop this information from moving forward by killing the messenger, or, at, or 
you know, attacking the messenger, which is what they did in the, in the push type case. What to do instead? Well, the proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences soon after that decision was made, um, published this very interesting paper that is a negative evidence paper that says there's nothing there. We looked. Um, I can talk about conflict of interest um, looking at these names, but I won't because we don't have time. But it, it's a very important question. Um, and they also based this paper that said exactly the opposite of what we were saying some years later, based on equally interesting optical evidence, right? Another gel where you might or might not be able to see bands. We know that given the nature of the samples that we were working with, that the bands would be weak, like I showed in our paper that was published in Nature already. I'm sorry? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. So I, I don't know if you guys see uh, any bands there or any suspicion of bands. We did. We did. I mean, I, this is marking my marking of a very clear band where it should have been for that 35S promoter, um, if you see it there. Nevertheless, the authors of this paper decided that that was not an existing band. And they decided that they did not want to pursue it further. Um, we tried to talk to them and say, hey, would you do a nested amplification or would you repeat the sample? So, you know, or could we work with someone else, go to another lab and so on? No, this was enough um, um, for the PNAS, the, the, uh, the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, to publish the paper and, of course, immediately to turn it into media coverage. Media coverage were the vanishing of the contamination that we had demonstrated um, just took off, first of all, in the pages of science as news coverage. And from there, of course, as you know, cascading down through the mainstream media into a news story. What you thought was real is now not real, is non-existent. Very interesting story. We were aware of the backdrop of this situation, thanks to very good and beautiful reporting by Jennifer Washburn and Eel Press. Eventually, we get coverage of what was happening in the university, especially, particularly the University of California, where I work, um, uh, to have this front story in The Atlantic, which is a wide distribution and very well-regarded magazine in the United States, um, where the question of in industry influence on academia was raised um, very seriously, and an alarm was being raised to say, we stand at a moment where we, there is a chasm and we're falling into it. This is the moment of science suspended, the year 2000, more or less. Um, uh, being aware of that, um, I guess I was aware, because I organized this meeting in Berkeley which happens to be the first time that Berkeley managed to do a webcast. It's the, first, the very ep first webcast in 2003, in which we also had a hybrid, we call them hybrid now, right after Zoom, uh, presence by John Losey. Um, Arpad and Susan came to Berkeley, and we had some conference. Arpad presented his evidence there, but he also participated in this public conversation with um, John Losey with Tyron Hayes and with myself, each one of us with curiously resounding or resonating cases. One of them, John Losey, working with monarch butterflies, he didn't have any particular interest apart from saying what happens when you have pollen from genetically modified crops being eaten by the monarch butterfly larvae and finding out that they, um, they had problems of course, Arpad's work, Tyrone Hayes working with frogs and um, atrazine, also finding, all of us finding ourselves in this really strange situation of science suspended, where you have evidence in your hands when it's obvious that this question should be asked, and yet, and yet, either you're being attacked to the point of being kicked out and sacked, or you're being silenced, which is, I think, what happened eventually with John Losey, who simply just backed out from his case, uh, and nevertheless, the evidence is still there. 
and we know the monarch butterflies are close to extinction, the migrating monarch butterflies are close to extinction, mostly due to the overuse of um, uh, Roundup in their migratory path. We knew about it, we tried to make sense of it at the time, and we were also very conscious about the fact that this was not isolated cases, that behind these cases was a whole range of others. And I just choose two examples here, very prominent ones. Angelica Helbeck, who had the goal of asking, okay, what happens when you look at trophic um, cascades? What happens with predators who are eating on insects that, that, that ate the, the plants with the, uh, with the Roundup Ready materials? Or Percy Schmeiser, the farmer scientist, who also had just simply simple curiosity when he discovered that there were Roundup Ready or herbicide resistant canola plants in his field in Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan Canada. These two are just examples taken out from a really large number of cases that we do not hear as much. And if you go to places where other languages are spoken, like Brazil or anywhere in South America, like Africa, where very good scientists were finding and asking similar questions everywhere I went, and I was receiving huge amounts of information, there were people saying, this is happening to me too, but nobody's hearing it because it's in the wrong language, because it's in the wrong place. How am I doing for time? Oh, good, you're not counting. <laughs> That's Oh, good, excellent, very good. Thank you. Um, oh, you showed that. Oh, I, now I understand. I'm not doing that well. Um, we understood there was a larger question here. I must say, and I, I, I'm sabotaging my own time here, but I must say that during this conversation, there was an interesting uh, phenomenon that I, I, I saw. Um, apart from myself, I, I feel like I went into this research knowing what was coming, knowing what the consequences could have been. I think in the case of ARPA, of Tyrone and John, they, the three of them expressed surprise. They actually said, I was really surprised, I was amazed, I never thought something like this could come out of my colleagues, of my institution, of the system. Something was happening that the system was transformed, and we had to suspend evidence-based science. A lot was at stake. There was a lot at stake in this, and we knew it, because we knew that there were plans not only to have deep relationships with Novartis, but there was another much larger $500 million um, agreement coming with BP, Sorry about that, British Petroleum. Uh, no, they were calling themselves beyond petroleum at that point. Um, trying to establish a deep, intimate relationship with the university to generate the Energy Biosciences Institute, there on the left. Um, in this urge to come up with a quick solution, a quick techno fix for what was perceived as the problem of overuse of, of uh, fossil fuels. So the generation of biofuels through so-called synthetic biology, which is another of the many terms that have been used for transgenesis, um, was promoted with huge amounts of money, um, mostly public money, because in the end BP promised 500, but ended up giving only 125, and they pulled out. We'll see, we'll see in a moment why. Um, with a promise, a promise that many good scientists within campus and outside were saying, this is crazy. What we're proposing here is that we're going to be growing plants or algae or bacteria that will excrete some kind of oil in a dilute brew. Then we're going to distill that and put it in our gasoline tanks in our cars. It is like proposing that we're going to produce whiskey, 
to put in our cars, to run our cars. And so the, 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 the logic of it was not there. And yet, again, evidence suspended, science suspended, was necessary to promote something interesting here, which was really the relationship and really the transformation of the university. What happened with that? You don't hear much about it anymore. The building that was uh, constructed for BP uh, became empty um, because this, I, I really like using Amiris as my case study um, of the many, many companies, venture capital companies, that were spun from the promise that biofuels will, were going to be the answer to the problem of fossil fuel overuse. And every time you see these companies come up, this is more or less the history of their stock value. This is, this is their value in dollars. Amiris reached $500 a share. Just to tumble down to today's, this is yesterday's, 69 US dollar cents uh, per share. A dramatic collapse. They're still alive because they can still play this game of evidence-free so-called science on the basis of the stories that we told at Berkeley, that were told at, at Berkeley. Um, there are more concrete consequences of that agreement. And um, luck would, would have it that uh, a, a, a well would blow up. You all, might all remember in the Gulf of Mexico, the Deepwater Horizon well blew up, m massive plume of contamination. Um, in, the, in the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, enormous amounts of pollution that the White House, in collaboration, BP was in the White House with the White House advisors, telling them what to do, how to do it, how to think about the problem. And uh, there was a question that the White House was just much too eager to have the case closed, to say there's no problem here. And there was, this is The Guardian on August 18th of 2010, saying people are pushing, scientists are pushing against um, the White House idea that that pollution is not a problem. Look at that date, August 18th. By the 24th of August, not a week later, Science Magazine produces a new, a new uh, format that was called Science Express. To, to print, in order to print this paper or to put it online, um, that was produced by more than 32 authors, a huge team of researchers, um, who claim or claimed at that point that naturally existing bacteria were enriched, that nobody had ever seen, nobody had ever detected, but they were there. They came out in huge numbers and ate the oil away. And then, nicely, they disappeared. So they came, came, did the job. I happened to have been ap approached by the person who was in charge of, the, of the, uh, the photograph, or was put in charge, a postdoc, who was put in charge of producing that photograph. And he said, that photograph is doctored. They just needed a photo to put on, and I, I refused to do it. But an undergrad was brought in with good Photoshop capacities, and that's where that photo supposedly comes from. This is, of course, um, unconfirmed. I just had that as a piece of evidence. But of course, this again, just, in, just like the case I um, showed before, um, was used immediately by Reuters the next day to say microbes ate the BP oil. No problem. Problem gone. Disappeared. Vanished. Nothing else to look at. What is, and I should finish soon, what is that transformation of the practice that we call science, you know, in our academic environments? What is that? I might want to call it the biotech project. What is the biotech project? Of course, there is business interest but it is something much deeper than that. One very important fact is that the biotech project is a project to understand living things. You can only understand living things if you understand them as technological things. I mean, this, uh, Rob Carlson is, uh, at that point especially, he was a big guru of what uh, he called, and he 
baptized the bioeconomy. He was the first person who put a number to the bioeconomy and started promoting it. Of course, he now is dedicated to venture capital companies and telling them how to do this, this trick. Um, so looking at life as a technological item to deal with and nothing else is an important policy, political transformation. But I think there is more deeper epistemological transformation, and this is a genetic manipulation of our institutions in the sense that it's a heritable thing that we pass on to our students. We pass this epistemological understanding on to, on to younger generations. And uh, just to be very brief and very quick, key elements of this project that needed to be enforced at the turn of the century are the following central dogma um, basis. There is no questioning of central dogma, even though, as Giuseppe said in his intervention, you ask anybody who works in the field, what about central dogma? And they say, of course we know it doesn't work that way, but that's what we teach our students. More importantly, perhaps, is DNA absolutism, which is to say you can explain everything if you have sequence data. That was a fantastically convenient way of understanding life forms because it was pre-adapted to the advent of big data, which I, I, I referred to before. Of course, that feeds on to the older and equally complex and complicated story of genocentrism, which we like to compare to the story of geocentrism. And the idea that the meaning of life forms is coded. That there is information that can be, without humans, without theory, without hypotheses, can be simply used to reveal the code of life. And at the bottom of all this is a commitment to determinism, a commitment to the idea that whatever you might think of free will, whatever you might think of the sovereignty of countries, whatever you might think of your independence from market um, uh, forces, ideologies, I'm sorry to tell you, but biology says you are determined to be where you are. And that to me, that to me is the major transformation that happened as a historical event at the turn of the century, of which scientists and practitioners of science like myself, like Arpad, like Angelica, and many others, were simply the victims or the, 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 the symptoms of that transformation that was preordained to happen. I think it would be very interesting and important to understand the dynamics of that preordained outcome in order to understand how those dynamics played in, on our cases, but more importantly, how they are playing out for the way young people are coming are to become biologists, to become scientists, because that's where the next historical stage for this epistemological development is going to happen. Thank you.